evening, everyone. I'm going to ask that you stand up to your feet. We're going to worship God. Amen. Father, we just thank you that we can come before you tonight. We just ask that your presence would be here. Lord, that your goodness and your mercy would be extended to us. God, I just thank you that you've made us to be overcomers in all things. Lord, that nothing can stand against you, Jesus, Lord, and, and your gospel. We just want to give you honor and worship tonight as we praise you. Please be lifted up in, in the name of Jesus. And everyone says... Yeah. 
heart will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing praise. Serve a good God, amen. Sing, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied. morning into dancing, amen. i 
graves into garden you turn bones into army you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you turn graves into garden you turn bones into army you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than. my life 
you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, sing all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that we are recipients of your goodness, Lord. Now, Lord, as we receive the goodness and the glory, Lord, let us be reflectors of your grace, of your goodness. Father, I pray for favor upon not only the church, Lord, but the people, Lord, here tonight. I pray that the favor of Christ would so be on us, Lord. And when we go out to the highways and byways, people would definitively notice the favor of God. Lord, we pray for the favor of Joseph right now, Lord, as we fill the storehouses with, with grain and provision, Lord. We pray for the favor of Daniel, Lord, as he was uh, advisor to kings, Lord. We pray, Lord, for that mantle of governmental authority to be over this church, Lord, that we could be influencers in the culture, Lord. And that happens, Lord, when the, when the likeness and image of Christ comes upon us so greatly, Lord, that it even forces our enemies, our enemies to be in favor with us, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the things you're doing here. We humbly submit to you. We thank you, Lord, that we... Uh, can boldly approach the throne of grace, yet humbly come before you with a heart of thanksgiving. And yet, Lord, to have the boldness and courage that the Holy Spirit gives us to go to the highways and byways, Lord, and show people the love of Christ, Lord. So, Lord, infuse to us courage and wisdom as we, Lord, take the community for Christ this summer. Bless us abundantly, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn around and greet a few people. Wave, say, God bless you, and good evening. So good to see you in the house of the Lord. So praise the Lord. So praise God. Good to see you all. A couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, I have the Hope Day video ready to show you to give you a little glimpse of what Hope Day is going to look like. So it's about two minutes, so here, you can check it out. As we look around, the division in America seems out of control. It feels like the ability to empathize with one another is at an all-time low. The words to encourage seem lost in the noise. But there's one language that everyone can understand. It's the root of a smile, the foundation of a helping hand, the first step on the road to understanding. Everyone understands kindness. It's free, it's a choice. It can't be chained by age, race, having or not having. The simple truth is that kindness changes everything. It can bring hope to a single mom. It can restore dignity to a soldier. It can say the words, you are not forgotten, more clearly than anything. And at your event, you will have the opportunity to be kindness. You might give a new pair of shoes to a child who can then confidently walk into school to face another day. Maybe you'll give a haircut to a mom who has chosen to forego the cost of getting one for herself for years. You might pack groceries, provide security, or paint faces. You might do something as simple as look a guest in the eye and ask their name. The kindness that you express in doing these things might be the spark that ignites hope in someone's life. Hope is what strengthens our families. 
heals our communities, and bridges the divides in our country. And we need it now more than ever. At your event, you have the golden chance to offer something free. And it's not just groceries or a family portrait or a job opportunity, as wonderful as those things are. You have the choice to offer kindness. The choice is simple. Amen. So we are going to be uh, invading the community with the goodness and the love of Christ down at Sh uh, Shoe Middle School, and that's what it'll look like. Six tents set up with just uh, an, an amazing, an amazing outreach. And so we're excited. The next slide, you could sign up, and please, if you haven't, uh, we're starting to cultivate those teams, so please prayerfully consider where you may fit. And when you scan that, it goes to here, a welcome center, haircut, photo booth, face painting, boxes of hope, food area, Friday setup, grocery giveaway, bounce house supervision, Saturday cleanup. Uh, so there's a couple places we can definitively uh, use people as those populate, and we'll meet here Friday night, the night before, for a prayer and placement. Where we'll have leaders over each tent and some direction and guidance and shirts for you. So we'll have that on Friday night. Uh, as we set everything up. So we are going to impact the community at a great level. Thank you, Matt, for helping just putting this uh, huge endeavor together. Uh, we're doing a, a great work for Jesus, the kindness of Christ infused into the community so people can not only hear this, but they can experience first the love of Christ and went, why do you do this? And we can lead them to Jesus in a, re a, a vibrant relationship with Christ and they can become born again. That is the goal. That is the goal, to see souls saved. Amen? All right. So we'll transition over to our teaching for tonight. We're in the eighth week or seventh week, um, which we're going to talk about victory over sadness. And it's in our uh, portion of Scripture from Romans 8, starting in verse 28. So Romans 8, 28, we're going to talk about victory over sadness. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know... My, one of my favorite scriptures. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. There's a condition there. To those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. That word is pro aritio. He has a plan for your life. To be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined pro oritio, he, you're in the family. Once you sign the contract, the covenant, he has a destiny for you. He has purpose for you. So moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, made in proper standing with him. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then uh, verse 31 what then shall we say to these things? For if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So this is a powerful, powerful part of Scripture, and we know um, what, a great, what a great portion of Scripture. It's easy to quote, but it's challenging to live. Right? It's an easy verse to say to someone, hey, don't worry about it, and we know God will work out all things when they're emotionally bleeding or financially falling apart. It's okay. We know God's in control. It, just, it doesn't resonate <laughs> with, with the status of what's going on in their lives. They're, sometimes people just don't want to hear it, myself included. Um, but we need to stand on God's word and need to know how to stand on God's word and be strong in the Lord in the fullness thereof. Uh, do we believe that God has destined every Christian for victory? Absolutely. We've looked at different areas, okay? Romans 8, 1 through 4, victory over sin. Because of Christ, we don't have to sin anymore. Once we come to uh, being born again in covenant, you, you can say no to sin and yes to Christ when temptation comes. I no longer have to live a life of guilt and condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. It's a trick of the enemy. And we went to Romans 8, 5 through 17, victory over self. As Christians, sometimes uh, if you can't bring the flesh under control, you can be your worst enemy. We defeat ourselves, and then we beat ourselves up. We become spiritually defeated, 
uh, but you need to realize you can walk in the blessing of God. Hey, like we said, the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, uh, and you have the power of Christ. The same, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living inside of you. You have as much Christ as you need, and you just have to activate that and not grieve the Spirit. You're accepted, you have access, and you have the awards. Why? Because you're a child of God. And then we looked at victory over suffering. Suffering is part of life. It's not always fair, easy, comfortable. But as a Christian, you have a helper that the world does not have at their disposal. As I said, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And, and you know, I'm so glad to hit the pole. I'm so glad we're a spirit-led church. We're spirit-led and scripture-fed. I feel so bad that churches don't talk about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. He's living inside of each and every believer, and to fan the flame and utilize the gifts and access the power and the grace and the anointing, the anointing is that the power of Christ rests upon you, available to you, as you don't grieve the Holy Spirit and you fan that flame, and God's power and his anointing, anointing is the Hebrew word uh, Mashiach, it, it, it means when, when, when that anointing oil touches the paper, it permeates it. Right? It permeates it and changes it. So the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, breaks every yoke in your life. Right? Anything that has us uh, just is encapsulated. Uh, as a Christian, I know when this is all over, I'm going to be in heaven. Praise God. Today, we want to look at uh, the fourth one, victory over sadness. How many can relate? There are a lot of things that causes us to be sad. Uh, as our guest speaker was saying on... Uh, Sunday, you know, he had a time in his life when he had to turn the news off. I mean, it's a double-edged sword because then really you don't know what's going on, and I get that too. Uh, but as, you know, Nandi, we say, be careful of your diet of information. Be careful of your diet of information, where you get that from. I don't have to tell you, like, you know, uh, the different networks are, are government-owned, and they're going to tell you what they want you to hear in order to get you to think like they want you to think. It's almost, uh, it's almost brainwashing. So you just got to be very careful that you have a balanced diet of information and good sources. So um, tragedies in life cause us to be sad. We have no answers. Hurricanes, tornadoes hit Kansas, right? How many have gone through sadness this year? Uh, you get heartbroken. Different things happen. Uh, you suffer death of a loved one. Now your life is full of sadness of grief. There's a hole in your heart. I'm going through a season of depression. Let me tell you, those are tough seasons. Uh, maybe you're so sad that you've given up on God. Uh, Romans 8, 28, we know all, in, in all things, we know that in all things, God works together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. We struggle with this verse. We don't understand how anything can come out of a bad situation. Let's, let's look at Joseph in the Old Testament. Oh, my goodness. From the pit to Potiphar's house, to the prison, but then ultimately to the palace. Does God work out all things? He does. He does. He had a plan for Joseph's life, but the plan uh, was, was riddled with pain. But in the pain, there was so much growth. Joseph's pain along the way positioned him for promotion. And you can utilize that pain as a stepping stone and not a stumbling block. Uh, we resign ourselves that sadness is, is a part of life, yes, the question we have for Romans 8, 28, uh, can I really know that God will work out all things? I thought, you know, the Lord was taking a nap yesterday when chaos and confusion hit my life. No, he knows what's going on. Uh, how can God take my sadness and turn it around for something good? I just keep coming up with this word, steadfastness. To be steadfast in the Lord. The devil always tries to derail you. Right at the right time, the right season, he just tries to, like, push your head down into the mud. When he's got you down, he loves to kick you, right? And sometimes you just got to have the strength of Christ to navigate through that difficult season to keep going when the going gets tough. Amen? And so uh, how does God take my sadness and turn it around for something good? What does good mean anyway? So uh, I'm going to take a, a quick look at supernatural resources, the supernatural resources to overcome sadness. How do I overcome sadness? You know, uh, different things that happen. How do, number one, we have a promise. We have a promise. God gives 
us a promise. And we know, know what? That in all things, God works together for the good. This is a, a promise of assurance. You can be assured that God is good. He was good yesterday, he's good today, and he's good tomorrow. His, his character and his nature is, doesn't change. God doesn't have a bad day. He doesn't get moody or cranky. He's fair, righteous, and just. When I'm going through something, you need assurance that I'm going to come out on the other side okay. God gives us a promise of assurance. God is faithful. God is present. God is good. God will love us. God's grace, his grace is more than enough. Right? And we know, not just hope so, or wish upon a star, or not, maybe, maybe God, maybe he's going to come through, I'm not sure, but, and I know, I know. I should have worn my shirt tonight, Jen, and we know. I have that shirt, and we know. Romans 8, 28. But as a Christian, God gives us a guarantee. God gives us an assurance, not insurance, assurance. What is the guarantee or assurance? We know that in all things. How many things? All things. And sometimes it's fleeting when we're struggling in pain, myself included. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I don't know how, what's the end result. And the report comes from the doctor and all these different things come at me. I just need to know God is still in charge. God is still extra large like a dozen eggs. Extra large. How many things in all things? God's in control. He's sovereign. He's in control of what's going on in the world. He's in control of what's going on in the Middle East, in Israel, in Ukraine, in Russia. God is in control of what's going on in America, although at times it surely does not look like it. You see the thing with Roe versus Wade, right? See, it could be so bad, like, you know, we want to give up. And for, for years, we just met as a board on Monday night, and I was saying how uh, Delaware just passed a, a bill the abortion pill. Yeah, just take the pill and kill the baby. Don't worry. How, how many months? It doesn't matter. Just take the pill. The same people that are crying, put on your mask, you're going to kill somebody. Talk about, talk about supernatural hypocrites. Hypocrites, put a mask on. Hey, but you going to vaccine, put on your mask, you know you're going to kill somebody. But take this pill and kill the baby. It's okay. Okay, come on, man. Come on, man. I I'm sorry. Help me, Holy Spirit. And then after the talking about it on Monday night, Tuesday comes out, there's a leak. You know, there's a book out, Liars and Leakers. I encourage you to read it. Uh, but that's what they do. The, they, the deep state, they leak things and to, to pur purposely blow it up, right? And so, but then we go, oh, my goodness, God was working on this. God was working, and we know. God, God's going to work it out. Now, it's going to basically, if it gets overturned, it does. It may, it may not. I don't have a word from the Lord yet. Um, uh, Roberts could change his vote the day before it comes out, like he did with Obamacare. He could do that. It's quite possible. Anything's possible. Um, but if it gets overturned, it's just going to go state to state. It's going to go state to state. So although, w could it be a spark, a precursor for the hand of the Lord to come and spark revival? It might. I wouldn't discount that. I would keep that in mind. Uh, you're not going to have a freedom of access uh, to kill 50 million babies. Could the hand of the Lord move and go, that's what I was waiting for, and send revival? We, we, don't, we don't build up revival. He sends it. He sends it. It's sovereign. It's a sovereign move of God. So we're waiting, and we're humble, and we wait, and we toil, even though in the midst of a culture going off the cliff, you know, Woman's rights. You're not a woman. <laughs> what is a woman? <laughs> Did we just go over that? And then we just settled that three weeks ago? Genderless? What woman's rights? Oh, what happened to my body, my choice? Put on your mask. <laughs> it's a circus, man. It's a circus. Who's on? It's like Abbott and Costello. Who's on first? I don't know. Who's on second? What I know. Third base. Hey. It's like da 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 Right. Excuse me. God is in control. That's all I can say of what's going on. The old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Remember that? He's got the whole world in his hands. It's not a Christian song, but 
We, we get it. I know that he can work out all things because God is ruling. God is in control. He's in control of every situation. Uh, what assurance that brings when I realize, it could bring assurance when I realize God is in control of every situation that touches my life. If I look back at my life and you know, see all the pain, mostly that I caused, the bad choices I made, uh, God helped me through it, and he used it for his glory. Thank God I didn't kill myself, which could have been possible. Amen, Eric? Uh, but he, uh, he was merciful and gracious, and he worked it out all for my good. Amen? I could look back and see his hand. When I messed up, God's like, all right, I'm, you're going to feel a little pain from that choice, but I'm going to make sure, Chris, you don't go off the cliff. Uh, someone said, nothing touches my life that has not first passed through his hands. Just re realize that. Nothing touches, like Job, nothing touches my life that first passed through the hands of God. So that's why, Eric, we're going to do the testing of your faith in the men's group. I think it'll start in the middle of June, near the end of June. Bruce Wilkinson's amazing. He redid it. It's so good. He redid it in a more modern version. I know if you were in the men's group, we did it like two or three years ago, eight sessions, and it was so good. Like we were like, 28 minutes went like this, and we are like, oh, it's good. So now he made it a longer, each session is a little longer. We'll chop it up a little bit. But um, it, it, when tests and challenges and trials come, God is growing us. God's growing us, and, you know, it's all in the Bible about him coming to test us in First Peter, in the book of James. Uh, it talks about us going through tests and trials. I don't like it, but it's God's module for growth at times, at times, okay? Uh, nothing touches your life that is not first passed through the hand, his hands. Every good thing, every bad thing, every struggle, Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord take it. Blessed be the name of, come on, Jeremy, of the Lord. We all know the song. It's from, it's from Job. He gives and takes away. He gives and takes away, you know. I tell the story when I had my, my first two churches, one in Jersey City and one in Bayonne um, in New Jersey. And the Lord said, was moving me to Staten Island. And uh, he said, uh, Chris, you're going to leave the church, and you're going to go get married to Denise, and you're going to go to Staten Island. And I said to the Lord, that's my church. I built that church. And the Lord said, excuse me? I said, it's our church. We built it, Lord. And the Lord said, Ex hmm, I don't think you get it, boy. Whose church is it? And I was like, it's your church, Lord. He's like, then give me the keys to the building back. And I was just like, I said, pry them out of my hands, Lord. And he did. He just, you know, and God taught me, hold on loosely to the things he gives you because if and when he asks you back for it, he doesn't have to pry them out of your hands. So everything Denise and I have, our house, everything, even, even our child, is stewardship. They belong to the Lord. I'm just stewarding the oversight of my daughter, the house. Although the bank owns it, really the Lord owns it. The day the mortgage is paid, it's, it belongs to, still belongs to him. Amen? So the Lord gives and takes away, and if it wasn't mine to begin with, it no mind don't hurt me. Right? This morning, God is in control of things that I am not ready for in life. God is in control of things that I have no control over. God is in control of my family, my finances, my body. As a child of God, we are a promised people. Stand on the promises of God. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting that any should perish, but everyone should come to repentance, metanoia in Greek. It means to turn from the wickedness that we live in and turn to Christ. Repentance, turn from the sin and turn back to Christ. This morning, stand on the promises of God because God is faithful to every one of his promises. Number two, this is a promise that not only gives assurance, but it continues. It doesn't have an expiration date like a carton of milk. Right? Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, what? God works together. What does it mean he works all things together? A puzzle box. I'm not a puzzle person. I, I've learned to do them on the iPad, on the plane, though. It's pretty cool. Right? Um, 
5,000 pieces, uh, it makes no sense when it's in the box. And uh, when you put it on the table, it looks like a mess. But as you begin to match the puzzle piece to the picture on the box, you can begin to see it's making sense. It's like someone told me one time, Chris, your life is a canvas, and you need to give God the paintbrush and let him paint the picture. The problem is I'm doing my paint by numbers. I'm telling the Lord, here's, here's how I want this to look. And the Lord's like, can you give me that paintbrush, Chris? It's uh, not exactly the way I see things. Work together. And this is, this is an important, important word in Greek, synergisimos. Remember that word. Come on. You plug your iPhone into your computer and it goes Syn syncing, synchronizing, right? Updating. It's syncing. Oh, I thought I bought that on iTunes. So you got you to, gotta, uh oh, my wife, did you back up your phone? Oh, I don't know my password. Oh. Well, what are we going to do when we lose all the pictures and all the information that's on there? It needs to be backed up. Well, I don't know what my password is. Well, here's how we have to save our passwords, honey. Because it needs to sync to the cloud. And your life has to be synced to Christ. On a daily basis, synergisimos, synergy, working together in sync. Everybody get that? Don't tell my wife I said that. It means what? Synergisimos, to create, to make something new out of something old, to replace, to exchange the old for something new. Oh, I, I don't put my automatic updates on my phone anymore because I don't want the, the COVID tracker automatically updated on my phone. So I put it off where automatic updates are off so it only syncs when I tell it to sync. And I make sure I screen what it's syncing, right? Something old for something new. That's why the word has to get in you and synced in you. If you don't put it in you, it won't come out of you. To interrelate like a movie, not a snapshot. To forge, to melt together. Synergisimos, to move. When we're willing to move and become more like Christ, to guide, leads us to different places. He synergies, he sinks us to eliminate, take out the toxins out of our lives, to connect all the dots in our lives, to press the potter as he presses the clay to mold it. The hands are synced together with the clay in Jeremiah to influence the pressure. He has a way of doing these things for us and to us. Uh, to shape or to stretch, to control, to arrange in proper order. God is sinking some things. He's working. I can't see what he's doing. I may not like what he's doing, but he's already went ahead of me. Right? That's, 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 the, that's the word. That's the word pro, orizio. Pro in Greek meaning towards. Towards. Like this player is going to the Pro Bowl in Hawaii. The, the football. He made the Pro Bowl, Pro, towards Hawaii. Orizio is where we get the word, look out there, horizon. You see where the sun is setting? So God is saying, Matt, I've already Pro, horizoned you. I've pointed you towards the place I want you to go. I Pro Orizio. Once you come into covenant relationship, without coming into covenant with Christ, um, there is no destiny because you're not a child of God, I'm sorry to say. Once you come into that covenant relation, God says, great, now I can sink you because you're part of the family and you're sinkable. Not sinkable, but synchronized. I could synergize most of you, Chris, because now you're part of the family. And he pro, he points you towards your horizon. That's where, anybody got Verizon? That's where you get Verizon, right? Uh, Verizon Fios. It's horizon, Verizon, point towards the destiny. Okay, so that's the Greek word, and it, it's not, I don't want to get into pre doctrines of predestination and choosing people. All people have a choice. He did not make us like robots. I don't care what the Mormons say. Um, you have a choice to make. God presents the gospel. Go and tell the whole world the gospel. Why do we have to tell it if they're predestined? Ah, uh, hello. You following me? So go ye therefore, preach the gospel, they hear the gospel, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you can, Romans 10, 14, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. Be saved of what? Romans 3, 23, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. 
So we need Christ as our Savior. When we do that, we become in covenant, the Bible says. Okay. Uh, the Christian life is not an event, but a process. I thought I was get, uh, born again, and I would be floating in my living room, eating oatmeal, speaking in tongues, and playing a harp on the cloud in my living room. It wasn't like that. Now, did I stop drinking and doing drugs when Christ came into my life? Yeah. There was a, it, there was a portion that was an instantaneous sanctification. Means I stopped drinking, I stopped drugging, I stopped cursing. But there was other things that was more progressive sanctification. I mean, God was still working on some things, taking out the old system and sinking me with the new software, which was the Bible. And the more I plugged in and synced the word into me, the more I was becoming more Christ-like, right? And my life was becoming fruitful. Two types of fruit. One is fruit of maturity. Fruit of maturity. I'm becoming more like Jesus. How does that happen? By exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's Christ in me coming out, his character, his nature. I'm being more Christ-like. That's my maturity. But there's also the fruit of ministry. What's the fruit of ministry? Titus 3.14, the fruit of good works. Hope day. Now I'm becoming mature and becoming like Christ to what? To sit here and watch paint dry? No. To do. First, you got to be like Jesus. And then he anoints you to what? He anoints you for what? For trouble. He prepareth the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You want a table prepared? Go find some enemies. I tell you, the quality of your walk is determined by the quality of your enemies. <laughs> we want enemies. Come on, no, no, no. I'm like, hallelujah. I'm gonna, blah, blah. Victory, victory, victory. <laughs> I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. In Jesus' name. It's a process, a journey, a walk. Every one of us will face problems. We'll have more questions than answers, that's for sure. We'll go through heartache, and there will be hurt in life. That is just life. But as a Christian, we know that all things work together for good. Work together is an action word. It means in all things continually working together for God. The reality is God is not only in charge of all things, but God is arranging and rearranging things in our lives for good. His good and our good. You don't see it right now like the story of Joseph, or you may not understand it right now like the story of Joseph, but God is faithful to his word. God is doing what he knows what's best for Chris, and God is doing what he knows is best for our lives. Think about it. When someone or something comes into our lives, when we suffer loss, hurt, pain, and can't understand it, and the Lord is trying to stretch us out of our comfort zone, we have ever thought that, God, where are you in this mess? Think about Joseph, a godly young man who probably should have kept his mouth shut when he had the dream, but he had to go blabbermouth. Who was that, Ralph Cramden? Blabbermouth, right? And ah, you're all going to bow down to me. They're like, we got to get rid of this kid. He just, and that jacket, it's obnoxious. Dad gave it to him, favored by his dad. His brothers were angry. They plotted to get rid of him. They were a dysfunctional family. The brothers come up with a plan to get rid of him. Well, let's just kill him. Instead, they sell him and tell his dad. They take some blood and go to his dad and say, look, we found this. Wow, there's some cool brothers, right? Joseph is sold, and his brothers carry out the plot. What would you think if you're Joseph? You go to the Midianite traders. They trade you to Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tries to put the moves on him, and he gets locked up and goes to jail for that, and he did nothing wrong. This is two times he did nothing wrong. Then he goes into jail, and he tries to help the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker, and he goes in there, and he tries to give the guy a word, and he gets in more trouble. And it's like he, he just can't seem. What did I tell you? The anointing attracts trouble. It attracts trouble every time. So Joseph's calling on his life. God was teaching him how to deal with enemies 
So uh, as I said, and then when he was given authority, second in command, so, mu so much about separation of church and state, right? I'm working on a great message for July 10th. It's called Evangelizing the Eagle. And it's uh, going to be on the donkey and the elephant and how they are two feathers from the same bird. Uh, and just how what we, we need to be salt and light into the, the, the political realm. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying we go in and we take over Dover. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but if we had an infusion of Christ-centered morality, it would be a little bit more balanced to say, hey, you know what? I, I just don't think that's a good idea. You know, there's wisdom in this book. This is God's word. You don't have to repeat it to, uh, uh, chapter and verse, but you can infuse the righteousness of Christ just like you do in your job. Right? You can infuse the righteousness and the love of Christ. So what happens when we turn everything over to the heathen, we get no morality and immorality. Right? And we go, what happened here? Well, the church is playing kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya, someone singing, Lord, kumbaya. We, the whole culture goes astray. And then we're like, well, what happened here? It's like, uh, we're, we, are, we are not operating in the sphere of influence, salt and light, salt and light, right? So Joseph is a slave, is torn apart from his family and friends. He could be bitter and angry at God. Why? What's going on? Uh, he, could, uh, he could have forsaken God at that moment. He's in a crisis moment. It's in the crisis right. moments of life that we have to make, uh, have a choice to make. Joseph made a choice to walk with God and not against him. So did Job. So did Daniel in the lion's den. So did Paul. So did Peter. Um, just in the word. So did Abraham. Abraham came from a corrupt culture, Ur of the Chaldees, where his father, Terah, Terah, what's his name? Well, Terah was the chief idol maker for Nimrod. I want to get into the story because I'll go off on a Perry Stone rabbit trail. <laughs> Joseph made a choice to walk with God and not against him. God blessed Joseph as a slave and as a prisoner, and Pharaoh promoted him. Why? Because he walked with integrity. He didn't turn on God. Things were starting to get better for Joseph. One day, Pharaoh's wife looked at Joseph. It's Potiphar's wife. She tried to, to seduce a handsome young man. She wanted to sleep with him, and Joseph said, how could I sin against God and your husband? He had integrity. He ran out of the house, and uh, he does what is right and now is accused of rape. And Pharaoh, uh, it's Potiphar's wife, really. I'm sorry. Uh, Potiphar's wife again, and uh, he could have became angry, bitter, and given up on God. Can you imagine what it was like to sit in prison for 13 years for something you did not do? 13 years, and all you do is have time to think. But again, with the gift of administration that he had, he began to run the jail. jail. Right? He still utilized his gift. Uh, living uh, with the thought of what it could have been, but Joseph made a choice not to give up on God. So in prison, he begins ministering to prisoners and gods. The guy says, I had a dream. Uh, what do you think this means? He says, oh, you're, you're, you're dead. Uh, you're, you're, two days later, the guy gets taken to the execution chamber. And the next day, the guy comes, and he interprets his dream. And the guy says, yeah, gee, thanks, man. Uh, he goes, remember me when you get, to, you know, when you get back uh, as the baker. So he goes back, and he forgets Joseph. All right? And then one day, the guy is stirred because uh, uh, Pharaoh has a dream. He has a dream about a famine coming. I told you there was a famine coming. Uh, you're watching the news? All right? It, it's all over the news. Indonesia. Uh, the fields in Indonesia, Europe, uh, uh, 17 food processing plants in America mysteriously blow up. How, how, how did that happen? Yeah, 30% of the farm went, oh, it's coming. It's com that's the next card on the table to control, to control, right? It mu you know, must have been lightning come down and hit those plants simultaneously. Come on, somebody. I mean, sometimes it's so obvious. It's so obvious. 
But, it, you know, no, one, no, no pastors want to talk about this, right? And no one wants to talk about it because it's taboo. Well, we are a politically incorrect church, right? Yeah, and we're just going to tell the truth. Tell, tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Because if we separate this from the culture, then what are we really doing here? What are we really doing here? We're playing church, and we're not equipped. I mean, we're, we're getting closer and closer to the, the book of Revelation is manifesting right in front of us, right? Revelation 9 says, in the end times, there'll be murder, deceit, and witchcraft. That word witchcraft is the Greek word pharmakia. You want to you wanna notice why there's a pharmacy popping up on every corner? CVS, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens, Rite Aid. Why? Because we're in the end days. Pharmakia. Take the shot. Take another one. Take another booster. Another booster. But you just got COVID. Why do I got to get 14 booster shots? I'm still getting it. Doesn't make sense. Just shh, shh, quiet. And listen. When it don't make sense, it's designed not to make sense. Confusion. Confusion, chaos, and deception. Amen? God was working on Joseph even when Joseph may have not seen anything going on. We know the story of the butler and the baker. Joseph is forgotten and sits in jail. One day, Pharaoh has a dream. And the only one who could interpret it was Joseph. Joseph is now standing before the most powerful guy in the world. Tell me God doesn't order your steps. He interprets the dream, released from prison, and given the signet ring, and signs all the documents. How would we handle the situation? What would be my reaction to those things? How did he handle it? Next page, God's truth is simple. I have a plan for your life today. You're not an accident. Your life is not blind faith. Your life is not based on luck, right? But God wants you to know he has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. A plan to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. You know what that Hebrew word future is? Akaris. I have a plan to give you akaris. Akaris in Hebrew means that which is behind you is that which is ahead of you. Say what? Uh, in Hebrew, the thought, the thought in Hebrew is that if you're in a rowboat and you're going towards your destiny, that which is behind you is that which is now ahead of you. Pro horizon, pro horizon. He points you in a trajectory to go to your destiny for a future. But the, in Hebrew, the, 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 it's, it's numerical and it's pictorial the depth of Hebrew, because that's God's language, right? <laughs> so so when, when, when he says akarith, he means what's behind you is what's ahead of you. So the, 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 the goal is not to keep your eyes on the storm, as Peter did, but to keep your eyes on the one who is the captain of the Lord's host, who's running the ship, and he will tell you. Because we see storms, and we want to go around them, we want to go under them, over them, but Jesus says, I want you to go through the storm, because that's where you're going to get to know me better, and I'm going to strengthen you through the storm, and this is where you're going to learn to trust me. But what did Peter do? He looked at the storm, and he began to sink. Jesus said, no, no, eyes on me, one, two, three. All the daycare people said amen. Come on. Donna, I see you going amen. I know. That's what we do in daycare. One, two, three, eyes on me. And all kids, oh, got to keep our eyes on Jesus. So we see this theme. About a future and a hope in the New Testament, pro orizio, pro horizon, pointing you towards where you're supposed to go once you're in covenant. We see the theme reoccur in the Old Testament. God has a plan for you to give you a future and an akarith, a plan. That which is behind you is that which is ahead of you. Just keep rowing. God is in charge of your destiny. Just stay synced with him and you'll be able to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. We could be thankful for Romans 8, 28. Oh, I got a storm coming. Oh, I must not be in the will of God. It says, what Bible are you reading? Oh, no, I must have did something wrong. Absolutely wrong. You're probably doing everything right. The storm has a promotion attached to it. <laughs> we hit the storm. We go, oh, no, no. Hey, listen, first thing you do is check. Do I have any 
unconfessed, unrepented for sin in my life. No, check. Then you're right on target. Then God is in control. And this, this storm is meant to grow me. To bend me, not break me, like a palm tree. We need palm tree Christians, the ones that don't break, but the ones that bend when the storms blow. Right? We can be thankful for Romans 8.28. It's a promise of assurance. It's a promise that continues, no expiration date. And it's a promise of blessing. And we know that in all things, God works together for the good. And the word good means the ultimate good for my life. Not the temporal good that's good for five minutes. Right? Not good, something that's good for the flesh, it makes me happy. Last night I'm watching the Rangers game and it's 3-3 in the third period and I'm like, you know what, I can't take it no more. This is not good and I'm turning the game off. My wife's like, oh my goodness, there's a deliverance ministry going on. And then they go to two overtimes, they're playing to 1.30 in the morning. So I said, you know what, I'll get up in the morning and I'll see the score. And we lost, so, you know, I it is what it is. I'm not, I'm not going to get sidetracked or like, oh, my goodness. It's like, so what? So what? has nothing to do with my life, right? What does it do with the price of milk? Nothing. God, um, yeah, good that is permanent and eternal in my life. I'll go just a little bit more. As a Christian, I have a promise of blessing from God. When you go through something, when we all go through something, we cannot see beyond right now. We cannot see around the corner. We do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. We see an event and we cannot see the purpose of it, what it is. Uh, the pain in life blinds us to the purpose of what we're going through. But God sees what's happening today and how it will sink synergy, Simos. Work together for the good in my life tomorrow and down the road. Rest in this promise. God is good because God takes all the events of our lives and works them out for our best interest. And, and, and that's where I had to stand sometimes on Genesis, Genesis 50, 20. What you, Joseph tells his brothers, what you meant for evil God worked out for my good. Moses said in Deuteronomy 23, 5, God turned the curse into a blessing. Why? Because he loves you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully. Paul said, I don't know why I had to get 30 lashes on my back. I don't know why they left me in Lystra. They hit me in the back of the head with a rock and left me for dead. And five times I was beaten. I was persecuted, struck down, not destroyed, pressed beyond the curse of the shadow of a doubt. I had all this stuff going through. If anybody had a right to give up, it was Paul. He got the bejeebies beat out of him. Everywhere he went, the first stop he went, he says, let me go check out the jail in this town because that's where I'm going to wind up. He didn't go to the Holiday Inn or the Comfort Inn. He went to the jail. He said, let's, he, Silas, Paul, Barnabas, let's go check out the jail because that's going to be where we wind up here. We got to plot our exit because the new Akaris, the Lord had a plan and the plan meant he's going to preach the gospel even if it meant me and him and Peter and the whole crew being locked up. And they were locked in the, in the prison cell in Philippi and they started singing synergy, sinking themselves to the Lord and the power of the Lord came and shook the gates an earthquake happened, and God said, there, exit. It's the power of God. Why? Because no devil, no demon, no soldier, no Pharisee was going to stop the plan of God for Paul's life. Why? Because this had to be written. This had to be written. And God was like, nope, I'll send angels. I'll open up doors. I'll send earthquakes. I'll send whatever I have to send to get Chris to his calling and his purpose in our lives, and that's what he does. But we must stay close to him. You know, we can't wander and say, thanks, Lord, I got it all figured out. I'm glad you gave me the whole plan. I'll call you when I need you. Thanks. Can't do that. We got to go. That's why he says, uh, let my word be a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. A coal miner, his headlight only shows three feet in front of him. Sometimes God will just give you the next three feet. But if you're like me, I want the whole plan. 
and you have to get used to just the next three feet because it builds trust. And you take the bite of the sandwich, you take the next step, and he illuminates, he illuminates the next step. Oh, well, if I, you know, if I wasn't here and wasn't obedient, the next door wouldn't have opened. And it just goes into taking, and it has to do with our intimacy and, and you know, our, our connectivity to Christ on a daily basis. That's why you're here, learning the word and applying the word and getting the word synced in you. So when different things happen, you say, I remember Romans 8, 28. Powerful promise to stand on. Stand on it all the time. Let's uh, close. You ready? Amen. So was that good? Praise the Lord. We'll catch back up next week for the second part of victory over sadness. I don't have to be sad. God's going to work it out. I trust him. Uh, Paul said, although he slay me, yet will I trust him. So Tom, sometimes I go through challenges, right? Hebrews uh, chapter 12, he said, you know, sometimes we're going to go through a season of chastening, rebuking, and scourging, and I just need to stay close to Jesus. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Here comes the glory of the Lord. I hear it coming. I hear it coming. Hallelujah. Here comes the glory. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. I will sing of the goodness of God. With all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. Come on, sing your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We just ask that as we leave this place, that you would give your angels charge over us to lead us, to guide us into all of your truth. We thank you for your faithfulness. God, we just thank you that your goodness is always among us, always with us, and your mercies are following us all the days of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.